Hi everyone, welcome to Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. Today we'll be taking up another important topic which will be discussed in the form of active learning and a bit of mind mapping. Today's topic is going to be pulmonary capillary wedge pressure that is PCWP or wedge pressure in short. We'll be talking about the important hemodynamic aspects of the wedge pressure and what are the pitfalls that we encounter while measuring it. So let's mind map the wedge pressure. It basically falls under the huge topic of hemodynamics. And there are, of course, a lot of things to learn under hemodynamics. There are RA pressure tracings, right ventricular, pulmonary arterial pressure tracing, LV pressure tracings, and peripheral arterial pressure tracings, and a lot of interpretation with different disease states. Today, we'll be tackling this one aspect. So under the wedge pressure, there are around 10 to 13 questions which are for your active recall. So use them to try and answer them first. And if you're not able to answer them, it's fine because we'll be tackling each one of them one by one. So the obvious question is, how is PCWP measured and what waveforms are obtained? So measurement of the wedge pressure is done using a catheter known as the Swan-Gans catheter. It has its cores as shown here. From After entering the internal jugular vein, it enters the superior vena cava, then the right atrium, then the right ventricle, then it enters the pulmonary artery till it goes till the distal part of the pulmonary artery. Of course, while inserting the catheter, all the various waveforms which are obtained in the RA, RV and the pulmonary artery are seen, but we're not going to be talking about it today. We're concerned with wedge pressure. So how is that gotten? Essentially, the balloon-tipped catheter, which is the swan gons catheter, which has a balloon at its tip, is inflated in the distal pulmonary artery till it occludes this pulmonary arterial branch. So as a result, a stagnant column of blood is formed beyond this balloon, right through in this capillary network and then into the pulmonary veins up to the LA. So that's a stagnant column. So what this column does is that it measures the pressure which is equal to the pressure in the pulmonary vein as well as the pressure in the left atrium. So essentially, this wedge pressure reflects the pressure in the left atrium which is derived by balloon occluding a distal pulmonary arterial branch. So what waveforms are obtained? The same waveforms that you see in the right atrial pressure tracing are the ones which are obtained in the wedge pressure tracing because it is essentially reflecting the left atrium and since it's an atrial pressure tracing, you will get the four typical waveforms. That is the AA waveform, then the X descent, then the V wave, and then the Y descent. So here you can see A, X, V, and Y. So in short, what does A represent? It represents atrial contraction. So that means the patient needs to be in sinus rhythm in order to get this atrial contraction, the A wave, followed by an X descent. Now, X descent occurs during ventricular systole and when the left atrium is relaxing. It essentially is a pressure drop in the left atrium during systole when this mitral annulus is descending down. So when the mitral annulus descends during early ventricular systole and the LA is relaxing, that's when you get a negative wave. The next waveform is a positive waveform. The V wave is the venous return in the left atrium through the pulmonary veins and this occurs when the mitral valve is closed. So that basically means that X descent and the early part of V wave, these two events occur during the systole of the left ventricle. After the venous return in the LA, which is the V wave, a positive wave, you get another descent called the Y wave. This, wave. this wave occurs when the tricuspid valve opens and there is flow of blood from LA to LV during early phase of diastole. So Y wave represents filling of the LV during diastole. 
Again, Y wave is followed by an A wave in which the atrial contraction or kick occurs during the latter part of diastole. In PCWP tracing, which wave is bigger, the V wave or the A wave? So the answer is that the V wave is larger than the A wave in the wedge pressure tracing. And both these individual waves are much larger than the mean wedge pressure that is obtained. So what is the reason for the V wave to be larger than the A wave? Because on the right side, that is on the right atrial side, when you take a pressure tracing, the A wave is in fact greater than the V wave. So the reason why the wedge pressure, which indirectly measures the left atrial pressure, has V wave greater than the A wave is because V wave depends on the compliance of the atria. So in this case, it is depending on the compliance of the left atrium and the ability of this left atrium to distend. Now, because the left atrium is held back by the pulmonary veins, it is constrained by the pulmonary veins, and also because the LA has a relatively thicker musculature as compared to the right atrium, as a result, the overall compliance of LA is much lesser, it is much stiffer than the right atrium. As a result of which, the V wave is greater than A. So here you can see consistently V is greater than A, V is greater than A. Another char characteristic feature of the wedge pressure tracing as you can see here is that it undergoes this phasic changes with respiration. So this occurs in inspiration, this occurs with expiration. Inspiration it goes lower, expiration it ri rises. With inspiration there is negative pressure transmission to the pulmonary veins. With expiration, there is a relative positive pressure. So the question is, when you have a wedge pressure tracing, which of these points do you take to measure the actual pressures? So the answer is at end expiration. And when is the end expiratory point gotten? You get it at the highest point of a wave. That is the point where you measure the actual V wave or the A wave velocity and then try to get the mean wedge pressure. So what is the clinical importance of mean pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? So this is quite obvious that it denotes the risk of pulmonary edema and of the two waveforms of the wedge pressure that is V wave and A wave, the V wave also denotes a risk of pulmonary edema. So greater the V wave then greater risk of pulmonary edema. Overall, we know that the mean wedge pressure, if it is more than 24 or 25 millimeters of mercury, uh, there is high risk of the patient having pulmonary edema, which is seen clinically and also on the chest x-ray. So an important question is that does the mean wedge pressure that we measure actually equate to the mean LA pressure that we are trying to measure? And the answer is yes. More often than not, yes. However, when it comes to the timing of this wedge pressure tracing, the pressure that we get is delayed by around 50 to 150 milliseconds with respect to the LA pressure. And why does this happen? Essentially, there is delay in pressure transmission retrogradely from the LA through the pulmonary vasculature to the pulmonary artery, which has been occluded by the Swan-Gans balloon. So because of this, there is a delay of 50 to 150 milliseconds. Now, the main waveform of wedge pressure as well as LA pressure tracing is obviously V wave because the V wave is greater than the A wave in these, uh, in these structures. And also, importantly, if the patient happens to have atrial fibrillation, then A wave would altogether be absent. So how do you see the timing? If you see the left atrial pressure tracing and if you see the V wave, the V wave usually peaks at or it peaks immediately at the end of T wave. This is the timing. So usually it happens around the T wave. But a wedge pressure tracing will have a V wave which peaks well after T wave. And this is the important thing. This is the golden crux to remember. When you're trying to un understand a wedge pressure tracing, the first thing that you've got to do is to look at the V wave and see the correlation of it with the electrocardiogram and if on the ECG if, if this V wave correlates with the with with a with a period of 
the ECG, which is after the T wave, that means we know that yes, we are dealing with a wedge pressure tracing. What is the normal value of a mean wedge pressure? So usually it is less than or equal to 12 millimeters of mercury. However, those people who have chronic heart failure, the wedge pressure can be somewhere between 15 to 18 millimeters of mercury, yet clinically or on x-ray, they might not have any congestion because of excessive lymphatic reabsorption of the fluid. However, this doesn't mean that these patients do not require diuresis because you still have got to decrease this wedge pressure to less than 12. An important relationship when it comes to wedge pressure tracing is the relationship between the mean wedge and the pulmonary diastolic pressure. So what is the relationship between mean wedge pressure and pulmonary diastolic pressure? So just to get a pictorial idea, this, this is a pulmonary arterial tracing. I'll come to the details of it and, and how to differentiate it from the wedge pressure tracing subsequently. But for now, this is the pulmonary arterial tracing and this is the wedge pressure tracing. Here you can see that there's a large V wave and there's a small A wave over here. So here the V wave seems to be quite predominantly high. Anyway, what we're looking at is the relationship of the mean wedge pressure. So this line represents the mean wedge pressure. On the other hand, this line, blue line, represents the mean pulmonary arterial pressure. But we are concerned with the pulmonary diastolic pressure, which is this, this lowest point. So we're talking about the relationship between this mean wedge pressure line and this pulmonary arterial diastolic line. So the answer is, normally, the mean wedge pressure, which is this, is either equal to or less than the diastolic pulmonary pressure up to 5 millimeters of difference. That means it is either equal to the diastolic pressure, which is the case here, or even if this mean wedge pressure is lower than the diastolic pulmonary arterial pressure, it will be less than up to 5 millimeters of mercury difference and not any more. So up to 5 is normal. The difference up to 5 is normal. So this is normal. So essentially, what does this mean? That means that during diastole, the pulmonary diastolic pressure has got to allow, that is the pulmonary artery during diastole has got to allow blood to go from pulmonary artery to the left atrium. So the pressure in the pulmonary wedge or in a sense, the pressure in the left atrium or the pulmonary veins which join the left atrium cannot be high. It has got to be either equal or it has got to be lower than the diastolic pressure, but not too much. Then only it will allow forward flow of blood. All of this is to allow blood to flow in a forward direction through the pulmonary capillaries in order to reach the pulmonary veins and then to reach the LA in order to facilitate pulmonary venous return. Now, there are two important situations during which this relationship of the mean wedge pressure and the pulmonary arterial diastolic pressure is important. Number one is something known as pulmonary venous hypertension, which is the hypertension which occurs because of left-sided disease, because of essentially raised left ventricular end diastolic pressure, which leads to venous hypertension. And it ultimately gives rise to pulmonary hypertension, which is a post-capillary type of pulmonary hypertension. Post-capillary means that it is secondary to the venous congestion, venous hypertension, which gives rise to this pulmonary hypertension. Now, in this first scenario, which ha happens, for example, with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or it may happen in cases of mitral stenosis, wherein the LA pressure is very high, that means the wedge pressure is very high. So what happens when hypertension, pulmonary hypertension sets in because of these reasons? What we see is that the wedge pressure, that is the mean wedge pressure, is still around equal to the diastolic pulmonary arterial pressure. That means it is just maintaining the same relationship that it would normally do. So a difference of up to 5 millimeters of mercury can also occur in this scenario also. But what about the second type of pulmonary hypertension, which we call pulmonary arterial hypertension, which occurs because of a precapillary hypertension? 
The example is idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. So this is not secondary to any left-sided heart disease, but is, is, is in fact because of a pulmonary arterial remodeling. So in these cases, the wedge pressure is less than the diastolic pulmonary artery pressure by more than 5 millimeters of mercury. So the difference is quite a lot. It is more than 5 millimeters of mercury. That means that the diastolic PA pressure is exceedingly high because of precapillary pulmonary arterial hypertension. Another question is, how do the different lung zones affect the measurement of wedge pressure? Now we're coming to ventilatory mechanics. So you have got to know that in a patient who is sitting up, not in a supine position, but in a person who is sitting up or standing, the, the, the lungs are divided into three zones, zone one, two, and three. The main concept is zone one has a higher alveolar pressure. That means it has more ventilation, whereas zone three, because of sheer gravity, has a greater blood flow. That is the main thing. So here you can see P capital A, P small a, and P V. P capital A represents pressure in the alveolus or in the in the lung itself, lung tissue itself. P small a represents the pressure in the arteriolar end and P V represents the pressure in the pulmonary venous end. So in zone one, the pulmonary alveolar pressure is much larger than these other two pressures because the airway compresses this pulmonary capillary, right? So there's a capillary between this arteriolar and venule. In zone two, the pulmonary arteriolar pressure is greater than, than the alveolar pressure, but the alveolar pressure is greater than the venous pressure. So this is intermediate. And in zone three, however, the art, because of sheer increase in blood flow because of gravity, the P small a is greater than the venous pressure. And it, both these pressures overcome the alveolar pressure, that is the pressure in the alveolus. So how do these zones affect the wedge pressure? Now suppose you've entered the swan Gans catheter, which is a balloon tipped catheter, and you enter it in the upper zone, that is either zone one or two. So in both of them overall, the alveolar pressure is higher. And this alveolar pressure will essentially collapse the pulmonary capillaries, as you can see here. There is no collapse over here. So it is obviously made out on these two diagrams that there is collapse of the pulmonary capillaries. So when this happens, the balloon which is present is trying to detect the pressure distally. And then what it detects is that the wedge pressure that you get reflects the alveolar pressure, which is high, and not really the capillary pressure. So you get a very high pressure, which is not representative of the capillary, true capillary pressure. So you get a very high wedge pressure, which can be even larger than the PA diastolic pressure. And we've seen that normally the wedge pressure is either equal to PA diastolic pressure or within 5 millimeters of difference from it. Now, wedge pressure can increase in terms of left heart failure, left heart issues when the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is increased. But it may falsely increase when your catheter enters zone 1 or 2. So there is an overestimate of this wedge pressure. In addition, because it is in the upper zones, there are large respiratory swings which the catheter is subjected to. And the appearance of the wedge pressure tracing is smooth. You may not be able to make out the various waveforms. On the other hand, if you enter the catheter in the lower zone, which is the zone 3, the alveolar pressure is no longer dominant and you will truly get a real capillary pressure which transmits the pressure from the left atrium and you get a true wedge pressure. But luckily, when a person is in supine position, which is when we do the, these catheterization studies, uh, most of the lung is in zone 3. And hence, you get more often than not a correct wedge pressure. Now, how does the presence of pulmonary hypertension interfere with wedge pressure measurement? Now, whenever you get a severe pH, then it becomes pretty difficult to occlude the pulmonary artery because it's a very hypertensive pulmonary artery. 
as a result what waveform that you obtain is actually not the real wedge pressure waveform but a pulmonary arterial waveform which is damped so you get a hybrid between a pulmonary arterial and a wedge pressure waveform so the pulmonary arterial pressure is obviously overall higher than the wedge pressure so you get an overestimated wedge pressure but it's not a real wedge pressure it's just a damped arterial waveform also because of this presence of severe ph the retrograde transmission of la pressure back up to the balloon in that swan gans catheter is decreased or attenuated and hence you get a pretty damped flattened wedge pressure tracing you cannot make out the waveforms what is catheter over wedging now this occurs when you are when you have enthusiastically pushed the catheter during right heart catheterization very distally into the pulmonary vasculature so you go right to the end of the distal pulmonary arteries as far as possible and what happens is that the tip of the catheter gets compressed by the vessel wall and as a result what we get is that there is damping of the pressure waveform you cannot get proper waveforms the v and the a waves may not be delineated well and also you may either get a continuous rise of wedge pressure or a continuous fall you do not get that phasic change of the wedge pressure tracing with inspiration and expiration a very important concept to be understood is in the icu setting when we have a lot of patients with sepsis hypoxemia and acute lung injury so how does the presence of these conditions affect wedge pressure measurement and this is the reason why probably that the use of pa catheters or the swan gans catheter in the icu is not done very often and studies have also not shown its usefulness in trying to titrate medications according to the wedge pressure measurements so what happens is sepsis hypoxemia and acute lung injury cause pulmonary venous constriction so this is the left atrium and this is one of the pulmonary veins this is the other so they lead to pulmonary venous constriction so because of this high pressure here the pulmonary capillary pressure is also raised right however the la pressure is still normal because there's nothing affecting the la say the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is normal lv is normal there's no issue with the mitral valve la pressure is fine as a result you get a high pulmonary capillary pressure pulmonary veins are constricted but the la pressure is normal so what happens is the wedge pressure that is that is calculated reflects this high pulmonary capillary pressure so you get a wedge pressure which is higher than the normal la pressure so high surrounding pulmonary pressure which is all of this because of this pulmonary venous constriction compresses this pulmonary capillary and it prevents the formation of the stagnant blood the stagnant blood column between the catheter trip tip and the la so there's no more a good line of communication between the tip of this balloon filled catheter and the left atrium and there is a huge obstacle here because of these conditions and you spuriously get a very high wedge pressure one of the most important salient features of the wedge pressure waveform is to differentiate it from the pulmonary arterial pressure waveform so what are the differentiating features of the, of these two waveforms now if you look at these pressure tracings this is one set of pressure tracing and this is another prima facie it may look as if both of them seem to be quite similar to each other but there are quite a bit of differences this represents the wedge pressure tracing whereas this represents a pulmonary arterial pressure tracing the v wave in this case is actually exceedingly tall and it may make us feel as if it is not really a wedge pressure tracing but is in fact some pulmonary arterial tra tracing so how do you differentiate both number one point is the v wave of the wedge pressure peaks well after the t wave so here is the v wave it is happening after the t wave this v wave is peaking after the t wave so this is the first point on the other hand the systolic pressure the systolic wave of the pulmonary artery pressure peaks during the t wave so this is the systole at the peak of t wave systole at the peak of t wave second point is that the segment between the consecutive v waves 
is either horizontal or upsloping in a wedge pressure waveform. So here it is, the two V waves and this is a horizontal segment, two V waves, a horizontal segment. Sometimes an A wave can also be seen. If there is atrial fibrillation, A waves will be absent. In this case, because the V waves are humongous, we may not even realize that these po this positive wave may in fact represent an A wave. When it comes to PA pressure, the segment between systolic peaks of the PA pressure is downsloping. So this is the systole and this is the segment between two systoles. This is downsloping, this is downsloping. Other points regarding wedge pressure is that the mean wedge pressure is equal to or less than the diastolic pulmonary arterial pressure. Second, the mean wedge pressure is always less than the mean PA pressure. So when you do a pullback of the Swan-Gans catheter or the PA catheter from a distal pulmonary artery to the proximal pulmonary artery and you notice a change in the waveforms, you see a change in the uh, mean pressure uh, which is measured, then we know that whatever was the initial waveform distally was in fact the wedge pressure tracing. On the other hand, if you do a pullback when the catheter is lying in the pulmonary artery and if you pull back further and it is still in the pulmonary artery and there is no change, that means we know that what we had gotten initially was also pulmonary artery pressure but it may have just been damped. Another important point about pulmonary artery, artery pressure tracing is that it can have a di dichrotic notch, which is not seen here, but I'll show you subsequently. And also, in some cases, the PA pressure tracing can also have a double peak, as it is seen here. This is known as rabbit ear configuration. And this occurs because when the patient has very large V waves, for example, in this particular patient itself, these large V waves will transmit onto the pulmonary arterial tracing retrogradely and lead to the hitting of this V wave onto the systole and hence it gives rise to double peaking. Now sometimes despite knowing the differences between these waveforms, it may not be very easy to identify the difference. You may still be confused whether you're really in the distal PA and whether you have really wedged or whether you're still in the pulmonary artery and you're just getting a damped pulmonary arterial pressure tracing. So what you can do, especially in cases of severe pH, when wedging becomes very, very difficult, then the only solution is wherever your catheter is, take a blood sample. If the pul pulmonary saturation is more than 95%, you know it is a wedge pressure sample. You know that you have gotten a good wedge pressure waveform because it represents the pulmonary venous saturation and that saturation is always more than 95%. On the other hand, if you get a saturation of around 75%, we know that it represents the pulmonary arterial saturation because it represents the mixed venous saturation. Also, another point is when you're trying to aspirate blood from a true wedged position, you may not get it very easily. Of course, that may not be there in cases of severe pH, when it may not be easy to aspirate blood anyway in that condition. The most important waveform of wedge pressure is the V waves. So we're going to be talking about what are the abnormalities of the V waves of a wedge pressure tracing. So remember that as it is, V waves are greater than A waves in the wedge pressure tracing, and we've already spoken about that. So we have to look at the various abnormalities in terms of humongous or large V waves. So what do you define large V waves by? So you call V wave as large is when it is 10 millimeters mercury larger than the mean wedge pressure. So if the mean wedge is say around 12 and you get a V wave which is 22, then we know that the V wave is large. Or if the V wave is larger than twice the mean wedge pressure, then also it is known as a large V wave. So there are various causes of a large V wave and the only cause is not just mitral regurgitation, also, although it is one of the most important causes. So severe acute or a decompensated mitral regurgitation will have large V wave. In fact, if you get a V wave which is more than three times the mean wedge pressure, more than three times, then we know that it is completely specific for a mitral regurgitation. 
you have to search for a mitral regurgitation jet, which otherwise may not be seen on, on the echo images. Maybe it's an eccentric jet. Other causes of large V waves is decompensated systolic or diastolic failure in which the LA compliance is impaired. So essentially over time, the left atrium becomes stiffer and stiffer. And we already know that one of the causes for higher V wave forms, either in the LA or even in the RA, is stiffness of that particular chamber. So when the LA compliance is impaired or decreased, that, is, that means that the stiffness of LA is increased with, because of LV failure due to any cause, then V wave will be large and you can get large V waves. Another reason for a large V wave is a ventricular septal defect. And the reason for this is because of the left to right shunt through a VFD, excessive blood flow or increased blood flow comes through the venous pulmonary veins into the left atrium. So, so essentially because of increased flow, you get increased venous return into the LA and you know that V wave represents the venous return in the LA during early part of ventricular systole when the mitral valve or the tricuspid valve on the right side is closed. Another cause for a large V wave is in fact mitral stenosis. Why does that happen? We classically know that mitral stenosis leads to large A waves. However, with time and when mitral stenosis is very severe and it is chronic, then again the left atrial function gets impaired, it loses its compliance and it loses its distensibility, it becomes stiff and then the V wave starts becoming larger and larger. Also, we know that with chronic mitral stenosis, atrial fibrillation sets in and then A wave is altogether lost and then you start getting large V waves. Other causes of large V wave is anything which affects the atrium in the form of atrial dysfunction, fibrosis like rheumatic fibrosis or diastolic heart failure. And as I've already mentioned, atrial fibrillation due to any cause can lead to a dominance of the V wave. When can V wave be normal? that is which disease state lead to a normal V wave is when you have a chronic compensated mitral regurgitation, which has happened slowly and the LA has gotten time to dilate and to adjust. That is the LA is compliant. That's when the mean wedge pressure and the V wave may in fact be normal. So this is an example, very tall V waves. This is a tiny A wave here, right? Note that between the two V waves, this segment is horizontal and it is not down sloping. Just to compare, we have a PA waveform where it is the segment is down sloping and there is a dichrotic notch. The last question is how does impaired left ventricular compliance affect the wedge waveforms? Now we've already learned that when the left atrial LA compliance is affected, the V waves of the wedge pressure waveform rises. But what about LV compliance? So when you have an impaired LV compliance, you get a large A wave in the wedge pressure tracing. That is because when the compliance is impaired, that means the stiffness of the left ventricle is increased, then it does not receive blood very easily during diastole. So towards the end of diastole, in the initial stages, the left atrium generates a large A wave if there is sinus rhythm. And hence, it serves to increase the blood flow from the LA into the LV during diastole. You also get this large, L, uh, large A wave on the left ventricular pressure tracing and you get a high left ventricular end diastolic pressure. We'll be tackling this on another video on the LV pressure tracing. So essentially what happens is when you have an early impaired LV compliance in the early stages, you get a large A wave in the wedge pressure tracing. This also means that wherever, whenever you get a compensated LV dysfunction, or early stages of LV dysfunction or early stages of impaired compliance, A wave will be greater than V wave in the wedge pressure tracing. Remember, normal wedge pressure tracing has a larger V wave as compared to A wave. So here the A wave dominates. However, when the LV dysfunction worsens, 
and it becomes decompensated or when the compliance instead of remain instead of being just impaired if the compliance worsens even more and there is more and more stiffness and the lvedp rises even higher then the a wave is not able to push the blood from the la to the lv during diastole so then in those cases the v wave gets recruited again and then the v wave pressure rises above the a wave pressure and this v wave now from right from the beginning of diastole helps in filling the impaired severely impaired left ventricle during diastole will i now be able to interpret wedge pressure tracing why not it absolutely is pretty easy the most important take away from this video according to me is that you have to learn to differentiate a wedge pressure tracing from a pulmonary arterial tracing so as always like share subscribe comment and press the bell icon and i'll see you in the next time when i come up with another video bye